condition. Uh, some of these herbicides that are used in, in these situations are, are very long lived. And so one to four years is not unusual. And then the other thing to think about is what underlies that field? What kind of soils are you dealing with? What's the potential to actually to tear it up and actually plant and not, not uh, cause a bigger problem that you already have? So the questions to ask is what's the current status of the resource? Uh, what soil types are involved? What are the risks involved in removing and replacing that field? What's the herbicide history? What's the option? What equipment do you have to do this? You know, if, if you're a rancher and you don't have a no-till drill, uh, how are you going to do this? And you just have a conventional drill. Maybe you're going to be you're going to have to have some tillage equipment to be able to do that. And you need to make a long-term plan. So what's the long-term plan to move from where you are back to where you want to be? It's not going to happen in one or two years. It'd probably be a two to five year process. So really it starts with a systematic evaluation of what you have. And there's lots of tools out there to do it. Uh, and really you ought to have this evaluation done when you first take over that field, maybe when you first uh, purchased it or when you took it over from somebody else, or maybe after you've redone some conservation practices, so a benchmark. And so you kind of know what you have at one point in time, and then you can go back and do measures over time to see how that's changed. And then that really helps you manage, change your management to, to improve or, or at least maintain the, the grass, the, the, the properties that you have. So these ought to be performed several times a year, probably prior to gra grazing, probably at peak forage supply periods, and at low forage supply periods, maybe after a, a drought or a, a stress period, maybe really wet conditions. It'd be nice to go back and get a measure of what things are like at that point. And like I said before, when conservation practices have been fully applied, if you've done some conservation practices. The goal is to manage and improve returns and protect resources, both of those things. So looking for a way to do this, there's probably multiple ways of doing that, but you, this is a systematic way that Natural Resource Conservation Service provides. It's a fairly new publication, it came out in January, 2020, and they, they rank things in 10 different areas. So I don't wanna teach you how to do the condition scoring. I really wanna just say, this is what you should do an evaluation of it. So we'll kind of go through what they recommend so that you can, you'll have a feel for what it takes to try and go from point A to point B. And this uh, conditioning scoring, they, they look at uh, different areas uh, from desirable plants, the amount of legumes are out there, live plant cover, plant diversity, soil cover, uh, looking at concentration, livestock concentrated uh, feeding areas, compactions, the soil properties, plant vigor, and then erosion potential. So the way to do this is you use a step point survey of the field or they recommend using a step point survey. So assume this box is the field or maybe it's just an area of the field that you're, you're wanting to re redo or, or evaluate. Draw a transect across that field. And so you, you wanna make an unbiased survey of, of what's out there. And so basically you set up a rule and you follow this rule to get from one side of the field to the other. And you may be several transects required to do it, but you want to do take a notebook out and and so you, let's say the rule is we're going to take five steps and at, at the end of the fifth step where your right toe is pointing, you sample that field. You get it, you get at that point and what plant is after your toe? Is it a legume? Is it a grass? Is it a weed? And then you take five more paces and you're aiming for maybe a shelter belt on the other end of the field or maybe a cell tower or a barn. So you Basically, you kind of walk blind, <laughs> so you're not biasing yourself. You just take five paces, and then you take the data on that point. Five paces, take the data on that point. <clears throat> you do 100 of those. At the end, you're going to have 100 data points, and you can tally them up and look and see. These are these 10 areas for this survey. Present desirable plants. Well, if there's 60 desirable plants out of the 100 that you sampled, then you're going to fall in this uh, area of four points, so you put a score of four for that. Set so legumes, maybe there were 20 legumes, so you might put that in a point three. And you go through this worksheet, 
plant diversity, plant residue, all these things we talked about before. For some of these, like the soil erosion or the soil compaction, you might have to go out with a spade and a sharpshooter shovel and, and do the same thing. Go five paces, take a spot, dig a hole, or, or just take a slice of soil and look at the, the, the characteristics of that soil, and you can come up with a score. At the end, you total all these up and you have this little table at the bottom, which I've recreated here. And of course, you know, if you get a five on everything, you're going to have 100% perfectly managed field, right? So no changes in management would be needed. If you're all the way at the bottom, then it's going to take major requirement and time and management and expertise to really get that back up. That might be, if you're in this one, two range, that might be a, a field that does need to be torn up and, and reestablished. But if it's in the middle or towards the top, then maybe you just just refine your management a little bit to try and maybe spot spraying of, of weeds if that's your issue. So that's one thing. You really need to do a survey of what you have to know where you want to go. And the next thing I would say is what's, what kind of soil do you have? What is the soil resource for this field? So this is a tool. It's really easy to operate. Just Google web soil survey. And you come up with this page and there's a little green button click the little green button and you're presented with this map of the united states so you can use these little plus and minus to zoom in and zoom out and you can zoom down to your field that you're of interest in montana and that's one way to get there maybe if you have the address you can just type in the address or if you have the township range numbers you can put those in these different drop downs it's a quick way to get there so I just typed in Baker, Montana and hit view and voila, I'm looking at Baker, Montana. And I used the little hand here and clicked on it and drug this thing over about 10 miles east of town. And I found this little field, it looks like a hay field to me. I don't know who, whose it is, but this is gonna be the one. So assume this is the field we're talking about that the, the rancher that walked in is talking about. <clears throat> the next tool you wanna use is this area of uh, interest. So if you use the square one, it's just a rectangle. You click on one corner of the field and drag across and click on the other, and it makes a rectangle. If it's an odd shaped one, you can use this multi point. So you just click and you work your way around the field. And when you get to the end, you double click. And when you double click, it selects that area. And then it assembles the data underneath to tell you what's, what's in this area. So I'm zoomed in at this point on the screen. I'm going to zoom back out to what it would look like on your computer. So look at there's these tabs here. So so click on soil map, and it'll map the soils in that field. So you can do this pretty much anywhere in the United States. So they have maps of all the soils across the United States. I think there was 134 acres in this uh, the square odd shaped uh, area I selected to begin with. 53% of it is this Assiniboine sandy clay loam, 2 to 8% slopes. So that's the 74C, which is where the homestead is, and this area all wrapped around that. So that's about half of the field. The next largest is Marmoth, and you can work your way down through that. Well, so if you want to know about that soil, you just click on this Assiniboine. And before I show you what that shows you, I need to describe exactly what NRCS uses for describing uh, these limitations. So capability classes, they, they rank soils from one to eight. One to four are tillable soils that, and the lower the number, the better the soil is. And so very few limitations in one versus all the way to eight where it's really not even good for plant production. So some industrial site, I guess, is probably what that would end up being. But one through four are tillable soils, five through eight are usually pasture range and forested. And then there's a subclass that they'll assign to it that says, what is the main limitation? So if it's erosion, they'll have an E on it. Or if it's uh, excess water, like a high water table, or maybe you're next to a stream bank that has periodic flooding, or maybe it's a, a wetland area nearby is perennial, perennially wet, it'll assign a W. And this, these will be assigned between two and seven. S is for limits of soil. So if you have a shallow soil, if you have a lot of rocks and stones, or if you have low moisture holding capacity or saline or sodic is the hazard, then they'll assign an S. And C is for climate. It probably isn't going to show up in Montana, but more deserty soil, soils like Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, California, would see that. The second 
thing that's so this is this uh, land capability class. The second thing they talk about is soil hydrologic group, uh, soil hydrologic group. So it's really erosion potential. And again, the A is the, the best soils and D is the worst. So A has low runoff potential, so it's usually fairly flat. Uh, water freely transmitted, so it has really good infiltration rates. And as you go down to D, you get to high runoff potential and and very low infiltration rates. So we'll come back to here. We click on assiniboine, and you'll get a description of that soil. So what it says is this is found in or it's first mapped in Fallon County, Montana. Uh, you come down here, the typical profile. That's really what you'd be interested in. Is it has an A horizon of zero to seven inches, the top soil, and then underlined by a B horizon, which goes down to actually to 60 inches. So it's a five foot of soil. So this field could easily be farmed, um, but it looks to me like it's in a hay field. If you come down to the hydrologic group, it's B, and the land capability class is 3E. So that it's the main limitation is erosion, and that's probably why it's uh, not being farmed very much. It's more of a hay field, it looks like. So you can do this with all these you know, soils, and you can do it for any. You can do it for your backyard if you want to. So uh, just remember that. And let's zoom back in and look again at this field. It, it's fairly good shape. There are some hazards off to the side, though, right? You can see all this white. So if you go back to the front page, it talks about. You can find the date of this this image, and this was in August or July. So this is salt we're seeing along the, the edge, and so. The Great Plains, you know, at once upon a time was was an inland sea, and as as we had in geologic time, as we had uplift, and it drained all the water back down to the Gulf of Mexico and to the Hudson Bay, uh, it left a lot of salt behind. So that's the other hazard I'd be concerned about before you rip up a, a field: is are you in a saline area? Oh, so we're already to question number one. So pause for a second. All right, Kent, I'll pull it up here. Okay. <clears throat> I can answer that question. <laughs> we'll give them about a minute to respond, and then you can answer that question. How's that right. sound? Okay, we'll give you a minute, guys. Take about 15 more seconds. Okay. So soils take a long time to develop, millions of years really for soils to, to chemically and biologically weather and, and become so the material that becomes from rocks and sand, but that become a, a soil, considered a soil, it has to have some organic matter in it. But well, there's no soil on the moon, there's no organic matter. Well, looky there, most people got, I was just gonna accept both O and A. I, I mentioned A before. And so for most agricultural soils, A is the top horizon. If you get into forested areas, then they'll have an organic layer, a little a duff layer, and, and actually some pastures and, and hay fields might actually have an O, lay, o, o horizon, might be only an inch deep, but uh, both of those would be the top layer of a, of a soil profile. It takes time for those to develop, and it's it's really a matter of how much organic matter is going back into that soil, and worms and and bugs and just leaching moves it down into lower uh, depths, and so you see organic matter all the way down to the sea horizon. By the time you get to the sea horizon, there's no organic matter left. It's pretty much in the B and A horizon. So, it's a tricky question. I'm sorry. <laughs> So let's talk about the other limitations. So saline or sodic soils. And so this is a map from the Department of Ag, Montana Department of Ag, that talks about the uh, depression wetland, uh, Great Plains saline depression wetland areas. And so all these uh, quadrats that are in yellow and different colors are areas that will have a, a certain number of, of low depression areas, kind of like what's in the picture here to the left. 
this area is no grass is growing. This is likely a saline area. I actually took this from this salinity.com uh, page. And so uh, that's probably what this really is. And so if you have conditions that will, will drive this, tearing out uh, grass or whatever is growing there, which is really probably keeping keeping your uh, salt at bay is gone. And so then you run the risk of, of having uh, saline conditions. And it may be hard to get back into seeds don't like to germinate in a high salt environment. So above the high line is probably the, the main area. But this is a range from yellow to dark red, I guess. So it has a higher density of them. And it's really for some funny reason right along the borders. I guess it tells you that North Dakota and Wyoming are bad, but I don't know. It's less in the southeast because we have more rainfall. And so as you go south in the Great Plains, you have less and less salt because it's leached out of those profiles over time. But we we get a lower a low enough rainfall region here that we still have a lot of saline conditions. So saline seed formation. Uh, if you go to the Montana Salinity.com, it talks about how this forms, and it's really an interesting uh, aspect of the way they really figured out how it forms and how to prevent it or how to recover things that have that have you have saline. On the right, you see this is kind of a wind erosion, winter wheat fallow system where they're going in strips for, for wind erosion control. We don't see as much of this anymore because we've gone to a lot of no-till and really once you have residue like this, the soil doesn't blow, so you don't really need these strips. But if you're still in a conventional system, and this must be August, this picture here is taken because it looks like wheat has been harvested. Look where the solve is coming out. It's not really at the bottom, it's, it's on the side of the hill. So if you look at the graphic on the left, what happens is if you remove the grass or whatever is using the precipitation, then the, your natural water table tends to rise. And as it rises up, it brings with it salts. And those salts tend to come out at some point down on the lower slope. And so the way you correct it is you re-vegetate re this area here, and eventually that brings the water table down, and then you can actually re-vegetate here where the salt is over time. So that's a long process for that to go through to get to. So if you can avoid it, you should avoid it. <laughs> so tearing out a, a field, if it's in a, a saline condition is, is underneath it, and most everywhere is in the state, uh, just you need to evaluate that before you move forward with that. Another thing we should ask about is herbicide history, right? So in rangeland and pasture production, mostly, these are probably three of the main ones that are used milestone toward on plateau. Uh, this is just about when to apply. Uh, the rates can vary versus if you're going to do it for annual weed control, like for toward on, it'd be a 0.25 to 0.5 pint per acre, but you might go to, to as much as two to four pints per acre as a spot treatment. And once you get above rates above two points, it may suppress perennial grasses and it can leave residue for several years. It's, none of these are very friendly to legumes, so they really wipe out legumes if they're in uh, in your pasture and you're you're going to a herbicide control program. It's the first thing that's going to move out of that are going to be the legume species, and it's really going to favor the grasses. If you look at plant back restrictions, so let me go back. This this data I got from the North uh, North Dakota Weed Guide. It's a really good resource. Uh, this information, I just went to the labels for each one and read what the plant back restriction is. So for milestone, no crop within one year of treatment. So if you're going to tear up a field soon after treatment, you're already one year out before you can really plant back anything into it. And at that point, cereals and corn, one year following treatment, any, bi any broadleaf crop, you need to do a bioassay, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. But you're usually out two to three years. Look at the Tordon. It's uh, up to three months, three years out for broadleaf crops. Same thing, grass, barley, oats, and wheat. After 12 months, you can actually get to sorghum after eight months, which surprises me, but that's the way the label reads. And Plateau, if Plateau is a uh, group two herbicide, so the clear field type wheat would be an option at 12 months. Uh, peas and soybeans 12 to 18 months, barley, sorghum, and oats 19 to 24 months, corn 16 to 36 months, and canola and sugar beets just to show you how 
the, the herbicide's still there up to four years afterward. There's still some activity and on some really sensitive crops, it can be as much as four years before it goes away. So tilling out a, an area or even spraying it out, it may be a while before you can really get things to germinate and, re, and come back. So it's, an, it's not an easy decision to make. A field bioassay, this is just from, I think it's from this uh, milestone uh, label. I just typed it in here. It's basically, you're gonna plant short test rows across the direction that you sprayed. So you can kind of get a, a response in different soil textures, different soil organic matter, different pH, different rainfall patterns or drainage to see how this crop responds. So then you observe that test crop for symptoms of, of activities such as poor stand, chlorosis, epinasty, necrosis, or stunning. And if you find those are significant uh, damage, then you, you're going to have to wait more time before you can go back to a crop. I had to look up epinasty. It's not a word I use all the time, but it's kind of a wilting of these plants. So it's a herbicide response. It, you can see plants just droopy from the top, and that's epinasty. Of course, you know, stunting typically is a side-by-side -side is the easy way to see that. So that's what this is a picture from somebody had a with and without uh, herbicide that's banded over the top of these rows. And you can see that this one's, these should be like this, but they're obviously stunted. So in the pasture, it's gonna be hard to see that, but you might be able to see, especially for spot spraying, like if some power growth is around where you spot spray versus 50 feet away from there. The plants should be about the same height. But they, they all have the same conditions, so they should have about the same growth. And so if you see some stunting, then that'd be evidence of that. Chlorosis is just the yellowing of the leaves. It shows up really easy on these dicots, but on the, the grass, the monocots, it's, uh, it's, you'll see it, but it's, it's a little easy, it's easier to see here. And then those turn uh, brown and necrotic. So just depending on how soon you get out there after the damage starts to occur, but you see necrosis, some act really fast to, to make necrotic tissue. Well, so let's get to what I was supposed to talk about, cropping as a reset for hay field or pasture. So the equipment you have or the producer has may help determine the path forward. So if they have a no-till drill, then you could terminate a pasture with herbicides and you could just directly seed back into it with a small, uh, Small, you just directly seed small grain back in with a, with a no-till drill. If all they have access to is a standard drill, you're gonna require multiple passes of tillage to get it down to where you can actually plant the seed in the soil where you have a good chance of it germing. And so in either case, you're probably gonna, I meant to delete this line here, but in either case, you're probably gonna spray it out and then either do tillage if you're required to, or you're gonna go back in no-till. To do it. So heavy vegetation makes for a poor seed bed. So remember that. So if you've got the way to probably approach it is if if this field is the Canada that you want to redo, or this area of the field is, you want to graze that area heavily or remove it as hay in the fall. If you can't do that, you need to flail or rotary mow it just to try and reduce how much biomass is above the ground. So it's degrades over the winter and you have it, something to plant into. It's really hard to plant through the thick mulch of material. So you want to remove as much as possible. And I'd say you a herbicide application prior to tillage with likely at a high rate, 32 to 64 ounce in the fall would be a good time to do that because you, you get a good kill of a lot of these like Canada thistle. You'll take that herbicide down into the root system and spray it and, and a week later or two weeks later you could you could do something with tillage if you wanted to but if you just till it you probably aren't going to kill all of the grasses and uh, you might you probably aren't going to kill something like canada thistle either or even bind it you're just going to actually spread it so plan for a spring planting spray it out in the fall and then if you're no till you just come in the spring and plant it if you're uh, if you're in a conventional system, you probably need to till at least once in the fall and then maybe work it again in the spring before planting. I had a weed scientist when I worked at Kansas State University who said, you know, the best weed control, people talk about different herbicides for the best weed control, but the best weed control is a vigorously growing crop. So competition is the best thing to keep weeds at bay. If you try and keep something fallow for a long period of time, 
you spend the whole growing season, every time you get a, a flush, you know, after every rain, you're going to be out there spraying. If you've got a crop to help suppress that, then you've got, and you've got herbicides you can use within that crop, you really have a better chance of getting control of those weeds. So small grain for hay or seed would be probably the best way to go. I would I would recommend after the first year, maybe the second or third year that you're rotating out, you might want to go to something with it like a, a legume like dry pea. Dry pea is pretty good for for hay. You could use winter pea or spring pea. Um, but depending on herbicide history, you may or may not be able to get to it very quickly if you've had a lot of heavy doses of of things. Of herbicides ahead of that. So I'd say consider cropping for at least two years to clean up weeds from the soil seed bank. There's a lot of so, a lot of weeds out in that seed bank, and if you think about a pasture, you know, as compared to a cropping system, in a cropping system, we control most of our weeds most of the time. There's a few escapes, but a lot of times you harvest before maybe the seeds completely mature. In a in a pasture, everything goes mature. All the seeds that that plant is going to make. Are probably distributed around that uh, that old plant, and so <clears throat> you're going to have a bunch of stuff you didn't even know was out there probably that first year that when you, when you plant, following carrying it out or spraying it out. Cover crops, you could probably work cover crops into the system. I'd say in the second or third year, depending on the herbicide history. But the one thing about if it's a hay as a cover crop. I mean, that peas as a cover crop, that might be something that would work really well. But you, if you've got any herbicide carryover, you're that's probably going to keep you from getting to that. If it's a mixed species cover crop system, you're, you really can't come back and, and do any herbicides over the top because you're going to take out one or the other of, of the different types. There's not any herbicide that's really uh, developed just for a mixture of cover crops. You have a mixture of plants, a mixture of types of plants. I don't see cover crops being a real good uh, match. And the only other thing I was going to say about cover crops is uh, it's nice to grow something in the interim that you're actually getting a little income. So if you think about the producer needing this, if you're putting cover crops out there, it's just money going out and you're not getting any return on it. You're getting long term return maybe in quality, but just one or two years isn't going to make much difference in that. So I think. Going with a small grain or maybe a small grain for a couple of years and maybe a dry pea or a third year before you go back in might be the best opportunity. To look at the uh, data from what you can actually grow for uh, forages, this is data from 2005. It's not, we don't do this a lot, and this, but this was across the state. So a post farm at Bozeman and Corvallis, actually in North Dakota and Dickinson, Kalispell and Moccasin. Uh, Winifred. Let's just look at the average of the average down here at the bottom, two and a half tons per acre for things like barley, triticale. They had things like emmer and spelt in here this study as well. I wouldn't recommend emmer and spelt just because there's not very really labeled herbicides for that. But barley and triticale might be pretty good choices for that. And you know, some of the better yields the Stockford barley, 3.6 tons, a pretty good yield. So yeah, I mean, you can make pretty good hay from an annual forage like this. When I first came here, I actually did a study with uh, Andy Linson, who was at Sydney ARS, and we did it on cereal hay, cereal wheat and cereal barley for hay as a nitrogen study. So if you just look at kind of the, the two things I wanted you to look at is just the total amount that you could actually grow in a really good year, we had five tons of of uh, wheat here, and this was uh, Willow Creek wheat, and he had about the same in 2011 at uh, Sydney. And uh, the nitrogen application, if you band, it's, it's more efficient than if it's broadcast. This is average over these nitrogen rates. Nitrogen rates, we up to about 50 pounds of the end per acre was probably the top amount that you had to apply. So you know, that's another thing to think about when you get into cropping is you're going to have to do some fertility management as well. If you look at the, the other thing I guess I want to compare was just look at barley compared to wheat. So you go in the in Huntley from seven to ten. Okay, so in 2010, the wheat was about five 
times 10,000 pounds versus 7,000 pounds for barley. And in 2011, it was 9,000 and 4,000. So it was a really big jump in forage wheat over forage barley. But I'm sorry, before I said that was Sydney, this is the Sydney data. So the second slide, I, I got it split up as Sydney, and he had the same response. So this forage wheat that came out a few years ago is, uh, is a really good choice. And so I would actually recommend it over the barley. So question number two. All right, everyone. This is our halfway check in. So if you're looking for a credit for attending today, please go ahead and type your name and license number in the chat box. All right, Kent, you can carry okay. on. They'll they'll be doing that. Well, okay. you can keep moving forward. I guess I'm going to accept two answers here, but I think I'm always going to accept one, either a yes <laughs> or a blank, and you just, you're probably asleep. So, so if, varieties for small grain forages, hay bed and haze have been around for a long time. So, those are probably good choices. Lavina has been around for quite a while, but it, it's, I think, it's a descendant of haze is maybe a little bit better choice. But Willow Creek was the one I just showed you the data from that we did there with uh, uh, with Andy Lenson. And it's it's a really good forage variety. It does not produce very good grain yield. So if you think about going to grain, then that would not be the choice to choose. And actually, uh, Phil released a new variety called Ray a couple of years ago, which is a descendant of Willow Creek, which has a little bit better grain production. So it still has the high forage yield that Willow Creek gives you, but if you if it looks good in the spring and you decide I want to take it to grain now rather than to hay, you'd be happy to have Ray as the variety versus Willow Creek. Haymaker is another one. I didn't look where this is from that's available. Uh, and then Cowboy is uh, Jamie Sherman is our barley breeder and she's got one that's I did their, doing their last look I think in 2021. It's scheduled for potential release in 2022. So there may be a new variety to choose from soon. So wheat or barley management, the, just remember the earlier you plant, the higher the yield potential, especially true for barley. So actually it's warmed up enough here in the Huntley region. I wouldn't be surprised to see some people putting barley in by Friday here. If we have a cold snap coming in this weekend, if we get snow, it might not wouldn't hurt it to get it in the ground. If they can get in the ground, I think there'll be people putting it in just because this is malt barley production, but it's true across the board. Uh, the earlier you plant barley, the better the yield. Wheat, you, it doesn't make as big a difference, but I think still you want to get in as early as you can. You want to seed into moisture as, as deep as two to two and a half inches deep, wherever the moisture, if you've got moisture at one inch, one to one and a half inches is fine. If you have to go down to two and a half, even three inches, you can do that to get moisture. Plant it into moisture. Use clean and treated seed from a reputable source. Don't just use bin run seed. You'll, you're better off to get seed that you know what the germ is. You know that it's uh, cleaned. It's not going to plug up. It's treated for insect and uh, fungus control. On general seeding rate, 60 to 70 pounds per acre for this. You're going to really shoot for a target of around a half a million plants per acre. So if you're looking for seeding plant density, that's probably the number to look for. The bigger the seed, then the higher the pounds per acre, just because you, you want to get that population out there. The drill width probably doesn't matter. If you're six to, I'd say, even 14 inch centers, it's not going to make much difference as, as far as yield goes. As far as weed control goes, probably the narrower it is, the more competition you get early on to really suppress weeds that are coming on. And you want to do some weed control prior to planting. So you can spray it out in the fall and work work it up or spray it out in the fall and let it set. It'd be good just to hit it with Roundup again before planting. And then at joining stage, come back with a herbicide that's going to take out any of the broadleafs or any uh, uh, wild oats that might be coming in as well. And then follow MSU production guidelines. So I'm not going to try and teach you how to do that all in one spot. I want you to go get this manual, which uh, Mary and Clayne and Fabian and Kevin and I put together. This is the second version of it. It's free from msuextension.org. Just go there, add it to the cart, and they'll ship it to you for Montana wheat production. 
There's one for Montana barley production, same authors. And actually there's another one that we put together, Montana Cool Season Pulse Production Guy, which wouldn't be bad to have on hand as well. And we'd be talking about hay, hay production in that as well. So now you're a grain producer or a forage hay producer, you need to think about soil testing a little bit more than maybe you were in, in range and pasture management. This is a picture of Clayne here taking a soil sample and using a hydraulic probe. Because you can use a push probe or an auger. And what you just, the, the amount of money you're going to spend on, on getting the soil test is nothing compared to the amount of money you'll spend on fertilizer. And it can help you identify nutrient deficiencies and where you've got, maybe you need a little bit more phosphorus in, in other areas. Uh, it can help decrease environmental risk so you don't, you're not over applying and you, you're, Phosphorus and potassium are always based on the zero to six inch depth. Nitrogen and sulfur are anions that are available to the crop, so they're mobile in the soil. They move with the water. So you need to sample a depth increment that's at least two feet. We, we sample three to four feet usually for uh, crop production. Once you have the results, come to my web page, which is sart.montana.edu. Click on American uh, Agronomy Decision Tools, and it'll open up to Fertilizer Recommendation. Click on that, and you'll get this page here, which allows you to put in your results from the soil, from the lab. So if the lab is in, most of them are in parts per million now, but they're in pounds per acre, change this to match, and then just enter the data. And I put in a, just a made up numbers here, a Olson phosphorus of eight part per million, Extractable K295, soil organic matter 1.8. So that's step one for the top soil sample. From the profile sample, if your depths are different than this, you can change these to match. So if you went 12 inch increments, 0 to 12, 12 to 24, just change those to match and put in what the nitrate part per million is. So that's step two. Step three is crop management. So if it's a legume, if it's took out an alfalfa field, you might want to select that. Uh, and the other, otherwise just leave it at other and look and see what's in there. If you're gonna grow wheat or barley to grain, then pick that. If you're gonna grow it as hay, choose grass and put in your yield goal. And you could change this to tons per acre. I chose two and a half tons per acre. Hit submit and you get this fertilizer recommendation, which is the same as you would get from this EB161 that uh, you can get from your extension agent. But it's just an online version of that. That I put together when I first came here. Uh, so it's, this is the fertilizer recommendation 4030 for that soil test. This would actually be crop removal. So if you had phosphorus to higher levels, you might want to consider putting crop removal numbers in there. And all these points are part of the recommendation as well. So read through those and make sure those make sense to you. Another tool I have on this site is herbicide selection. So if you click on herbicide selection, you come to this page. And so it's another three step, I guess all my tools are three step processes. So choose your initial condition. So I said, we're gonna put barley in the first year and spring wheat would be the next year's crop, post-emergent. And so this is really built for grain production and I'm, I'm not so sure it's really good for pasture management. For in this interim period, when you're growing a, a small grain, this could help you control give you ideas on how to control weeds in that. So I just pick the weeds that are there. So if you're gonna use herbicides, you need to know three things, right? You need to know what crop you're, it's labeled for. So it's labeled for barley. You need to know what the plant back restriction is. So if it's spring wheat, anything that doesn't let you get back to spring wheat, if it was peas, you could put that in there. You have to be careful on that. So, and then you pick out whatever weeds that you have. So I just chose buffalo burr, uh, sow thistle and Canada thistle and click build the table. You'll get this display. It shows a list of herbicides that meet those conditions. And clarity for one has control on all three of those species. So does stinger and so does curtail. Um, and the prices, this all came, and you can read about this on my website, it came from North Dakota. Uh, we guide, I think the 2016 version. I need to probably update those. But it's a guideline to just kind of give you an idea. And so if you want to know a little bit more about Stinger, whether when to spray it and how to mix it and what rates to use, 
click on the name and it'll take you to the label. So it's just a quick way to get to the label and find some options. So finally, uh, you got a lot of this data from this from this North Dakota Weed Control Guide. It's a very good guide, and just just Google North Dakota Weed Control Guide, and 2021 is available now. In that book, on page 64, there's one about noxious weeds and troublesome weeds. And so there's some more. You can go to those pages and look, in, and they have different herbicides that they recommend for those. So you'd have to check for those herbicides backwards to make sure they're labeled for the crop that you want. I think what I did here is I went to page 74. Yeah, so it's toad flax and Dalmatian yellow toad flax control. So there's some of these herbicides that are listed for that. I don't know that these are going to be labeled for control uh, in wheat, but just in general, it's a good source of information. So, so the goals to restoring a hay field or pasture land. You want to substitute hay or graze annual forage for one or more years in order to clean up weed or soil compaction issues. You want to try and keep the soil covered with some crop growing each year to reduce soil erosion and salting out potential. And then the other long term goal would be to manage herbicides as you get into this from long residual chemistries to shorter plant back restrictions so that you can get back into a hay field or pasture without any residual problems. One guide for doing that, this is an old one from 2003, written by Dennis Cash and others, but it's still available. They still charge you five bucks for this, but uh, that's probably well worth it. There's really good information in here on different species and cultivars and seeding techniques and how to get back into, to move back into pasture production. And finally, I just want to make you aware there's this new seminar series that's coming up with our, the new, uh, Extension uh, forage specialist, Dr. Hayes Goosey. So starting March 18th at 6 p.m. and different speakers through the through this uh, series. So it might be of interest to you. And just wanted to, if you do, then just go to this little bit, register at that site. I basically wanted you to know Dr. Hayes Goosey is the guy to talk to from now on on forage questions because he's he is the extension forage specialist. He started I think about a month ago. So, I've got to the end of my talk, and here's question number three. So, I mentioned several resources during this talk. Where do you find them? I think Jane's got this in typed in to your little system. Is that right? I do. Yep. The poll is open. The poll. The pool is open. <laughs> I used to be a lifeguard, so yeah, I used to say that all the time. The poll oh, is poll. open. <laughs> So either way, <laughs> well, if you have a type in, I'll leave it at this page. That sounds good. Kent will give okay. them just a 30 seconds or so to put their answer in. And then we do have some questions for you. So I hope okay. nobody goes away too soon because we have some good questions in the Q&A box. About 10 more seconds on the poll. 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 <laughs> and actually, five, four, three, two, one, I'd accept any of those answers because they're all correct. Let's see what people said. Just Google it. I thought that would get the most. <laughs> no answer is got the most, or maybe the extension website. <laughs> and we did put the the link to the Southern Ag Research Center website where Kent is located and has the fertilizer and herbicide selection tools. Those are great tools, and I encourage any of you to check them out, especially if you're working with folks that are kind of making this transition from annual to perennial or perennial to annual to try to deal with weeds. There's there's some really useful tools there. Okay, Kent, are you ready for some questions and answers? Sure. All right. I think well, where we have questions, you have you need the an you have to have the answers. I'll give, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a, I don't guarantee anything. The first question is coming from Clay. He asked, do you need to remove alfalfa completely 
prior to reestablishing a new stand. Of alfalfa? Yeah. Yes, yes. So alfalfa, uh, what's the word? It, it has, it releases a chemical that prevents other alfalfa seeds from germinating. So you really need to rotate out for a couple of years, actually, so you, you can get back at least one year so you can get back into alfalfa and have, have a good chance that the seed that you plant is going to germinate. There's a chemistry yeah. for that, Jane, you probably know the answer. I don't know. Oh, allelopathy. Allelopathy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a word that just is on the tip of your tongue <laughs> at any time. <laughs> uh, Tom, wa Tom was wondering, uh, oh, I think he got his answer. He was wondering what were the wheat varieties used for hay, but I think he, he yeah, found so that. Willow, Willow Creek and Ray would be the two that are they're really, so they're onless or semi onless. I guess they have another name, but tiny little on, so they're, and all those those uh, hay bed and haze are also that way, so that they don't get stuck in your cow's throat, so. Okay, Kent, another question. Do you have any comments or suggestions regarding uh, managing tall buttercup in lowland river bottom hay fields with clover? <laughs> That's a tough one. I'll let Jane answer that one. <laughs> Well, I, I will try to chime in here. We did do some work a few years back on managing tall buttercup. This was work done in Madison County where tall buttercup is a, a problem. And we tried, we tested like three different herbicides, including uh, milestone and dicamba. And uh, well, it was perspective at the time. I think it's method now. All of those herbicides, they 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 damaged the clover that was in these hay fields. But we also tried mowing and fertilization. And then, you know, we had all those herbicides and mowing and fertilization cross with each other. And actually mowing reduced tall buttercup by about 70%. So even mowing by itself, um, you know, was was it wasn't as effective as herbicides, but it allowed you to, to reduce the tall buttercup while protecting those clovers. Uh, can I can I ask a follow up question on that? Yep. So these hay fields, this was a question coming from me because it's surrounding me. Um, these hay fields only get cut one time a year. So when you talk about mowing, is that still effective? Yeah, that's something we when in that study we did, we mowed um about at when the tall buttercup was flowering which i think was a little might that might have been just before the producers wanted to harvest the fields for hay does that seem about right becky yeah it does because they hay pretty late another finding we we had from that study was just the role that the irrigation was playing in in yeah. Uh, helping tall buttercup kind of have its little niche and habitat there. So I wonder too if if you thought about mowing and maybe just changing irrigation for even a year, if you could if you could reduce irrigation. And I'm thinking about fields where tall buttercup has kind of crossed a threshold where you really feel like it's impacting your production, and it does have some toxicity, as you know. So it's probably going to be a combination of multiple management practices, there's really not an easy answer there, just like Kent, you know, was talking about with his information as well. Uh, let's see. I, um, I just want to, there's a, there's a comment here from Jesse. Um, I'm just going to read it. I haven't had time to look through all of it, but she says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. As county weed folks, whether we like it or not, noxious weeds and cropping system falls to us, even if we don't like talking about it. And working with producers on weed plants, this this brings to light questions we need to be asking. So yeah, this uh, uh, that was part of the, the motivation for, for this topic that Kent covered today. So yeah, those those noxious weeds don't just stay on the roadside <laughs> or just stay in the rangeland. Um, question here from Jeff, can you give us a few ideas on improving tame pasture that is becoming dominated by smooth brome? 
Boom. Well, like I said, I, I work in crop production, so I'm probably not the guy to really answer that question. I know there is some ways of reseeding. You could you could spray out sections and 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 drill in uh, legume legumes for to try and get some diversity. But the natural progression is for the grasses to take over. It seems like uh, fertility management might have a play a role in that too. I know that. The more nitrogen you apply to fields, that really favors grasses over legumes. The legumes fix their own nitrogen, but if, if the competition's there by the grass and they've got nitrogen to, to work with, they'll outcompete the legumes. So, I don't know, Jane. Maybe you have a a better answer for that than well. Than I. Well, I I don't have a good answer now, but we are in the middle of a about a five year study looking at this at multiple sites across the state. And uh, I, uh, we're working with NRCS on this project and and other people as well. Um, so hopefully we will have a better answer for you in a couple years, Jeff. Uh, and um, it's definitely a topic that multiple people have been shown interest in and we're gonna try to get some answers for you. Let's see, having a little bit of trouble just trying to find the questions and answers here. Becky, am I missing any? Can you see any that I'm missing? Uh, yeah, there's there's actually quite a few here, Jane. So let me go through. Um, so a question from um, Tom Leo. We really do need to consider pastures as a crop. That's more of a comment than a question. I apologize for that. And then, um, from Larry, you suggested interseeding as an option to establish a better plant population. It has not been very successful. Would be what would be your interseeding guidelines? Hmm. Well, I guess just the general statement. I, I really haven't worked in this field to be able to do that, but it's it comes down to moisture and competition, right? So. If you've got an actively growing plant there and you try and seed next to it, it's not a very good place. The surface gets dried out the quickest, and so it's not a good spot for seeds to germ. So anything you can do to suppress the crop that's out there that you want to interseed, and maybe maybe just set it back for a period of time, uh, that would be one way of doing it. The, uh, I guess the other would be if you've got like alfalfa, for example, if you're wanting to interseed some grass into that, when it's dormant would be a time that you could still get some grasses established. And once they're established, uh, then they can compete a little bit. But yeah, if it's if that's one of the rules for no-till establishment is you don't plant through green. I would say shit, but that's I'm not supposed to say that. So don't don't plant into green stuff. <laughs> plant into to a dead a field. So you are, it, you're just asking for trouble because of the competition. And it just has to dry out that seed zone and you don't get seeds to germ. Okay, yeah, I think that, the other thing. I'm sorry, Ken. The, just the increased seeding rate might be the other option because you're gonna have some that aren't gonna survive. Uh, so so I don't know, Jane, just one more quick question and then I think yeah. we'll wrap it up. Is two years long enough after crested to plant a native seed mix? Native grass mix, excuse me. I think that the, so again, I'm not in this field, so, but I would say if you don't see crested grass coming back after two years, then it's, it's obviously long enough. You know, you, you would know, I would think by that point in time, whether you've still got seed coming back. If it's, if it's, if it's gone, then you're probably fine to go back into your, whatever you're trying to get to. I right or wrong on that, Jane? I think uh, we're, yeah, we're the ju uh, jury's still out. That's another okay. species we're working on. I think we're going to have to have a webinar in the future on um, improving diversity and smooth brome and crested wheatgrass. We can do that. So, uh, Kent, I want to say thank you. Um, if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing your screen. That will allow me to just show a quick slide here for our yeah. attendees before we call no it an hour. Uh, maybe it's here. Should be. OK, 
kind of maybe up at the, if you hover over the top of your screen, oh, you might see an orange button that says stop sharing. Yep. Yep. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Okay, thanks again, Kent. That was great. Um, we are happy that you took it upon yourself to tackle that uh, tough topic. <laughs> it's a tough sure. one. It, there aren't easy answers, it seems like. So a lot, um, a lot of links in that presentation. Are you making that available to everybody? Or yes, it was on the website where where the we the Wednesday webinars are advertised where you register, but yeah, I'll put those links on there, Kent. So yeah. thank you. Couple <laughs> housekeeping things before we say goodbye. Um, if you if you're looking for that credit applicator credit, make sure you type your name and license number before you leave. Uh, next week we're taking a week off, so there will be no webinar, but we will. Um, rejoin on March 17th, where we'll be talking about revegetation with Monica Picorni. I think she'll be kind of carrying on some of these ideas. It, it'll be, I think, a good, uh, a good sequence of webinars. And then the other thing I would ask you is just to please, um, when you leave the webinar today, take a couple minutes to fill out the evaluation. The evaluation, I share those results with our presenters so they can get some feedback. And then it also helps us to see how useful the webinars are for all of you. So please take a couple minutes, maybe just one minute to do that before you go on your way today. So thanks again, Kent. And thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Don't forget to enter your name and license number. We'll leave the meeting open for a couple minutes here so you can do that.